to see you. Thank you. I'll go on this then. So, Matthew, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us at Wired Impact. Um, so, as Greg talked a bit about before, I think what's really fascinating, and one of the things that's really fascinating, is this transition you made from uh, top-tier football into becoming an environmental entrepreneur. So, I mean, it's, you could have done anything with your, after your career in football. Why did you choose to try and reform the, the chemicals industry? First of all, thank you for having me. I'm very pleased to be here today. I think it's a few reasons. I see two or three. I mean, the first one is, I think, education. I grew up by the sea. My dad uh, used to be a, a sea lover, uh, a diver by passion. And I remember from a very young age collecting the garbage on the beach. So this is one aspect. The second aspect is I like the challenge. And I remember as a young kid being told, OK, I will never become a football player. And uh, after many years of work, I became one of them. So obviously, moving into that direction and starting a biochemical company when everybody was telling me, OK, but do you have any chemical background? So I said, OK, this is definitely something I want to do. And the last one is about having an impact. You know, I've enjoyed uh, very much uh, football, uh, football career where I was able to, to give a lot of joy to fans, but now, you know, the question was, okay, how can I give back and what can be my impact? And having an impact in that world and being able to have a, a positive impact is, for me, super exciting. Mm. And how, but how did, you, how did you find the biochemicals industry? Did you go out seeking for a way to have an impact or were you like, this is what I want to do? So I think um, what's important to explain is what is a chemical industry. I mean, the chemical industry is, is everywhere around us. I mean, every single product we buy every day, going from a shampoo to a deodorant to some pants or detergent, everything is made of a formulation of ingredients. This is a chemical industry. Even the chairs you're sitting on, I mean, are made of a chemical product. So this is an industry which is everywhere. I mean, this industry is representing today one third of the oil demand, which is like huge. And by 2050, it will be more than the transportation, meaning like cars, plane, trucks. So this is an industry which which is very much unknown, but it's an industry which we need to also like accelerate the transition. So those days what's happening is you have a massive pressure coming from the regulator. So the EU is pushing with a green deal to, to go away from, I mean, like the, the chemical pollution. And on the other side, you also have the consumer, people like you, people like me, who want safer and more sustainable pro uh, product. Mm -hmm. and, and you've spoken about trying to create the intel of the chemicals world, which I think is quite cool and I mean key to this solution is to replace petroleum with what's being called this wonder chemical level linic acid so what exactly is this chemical where does it come from so let me explain you a little bit what we do so if you take the consumer good product which we use every day going from shampoo deodorant pens detergent which we use for for the house all those products are made of ingredients coming from the petrochemical industry this petrochemical industry, as I was saying, is generating one third of the oil demand. Okay? So what we are doing, in a few words, we're trying to substitute the harmful ingredients, which are having like a negative impact on the people, on the planet, by more sustainable ones. What does that mean? So you have two ways of doing that. So on one side, those ingredients come from petro base, okay, oil base. And on the other side, I mean, what we're doing, I mean, like our ingredients are coming from plant-based. Plant-based means like agriculture waste. So you have first generation, which at the time we used to use corn, sugar, but obviously like this is not a good thing because some people, I mean, need to eat the sugar, some people need to eat this corn. So what we're doing now, we're using a second generation feedstock, which means we use agriculture waste and we convert that into like a molecule, an ingredient. This ingredient is called levolinic acid. It's a, what we call a building block. And I like to, to make the parallel between oil and levolinic acid. Once you extract oil, you refine oil, and that gives you the opportunity to go into a large number of derivatives, okay? And those derivatives can be found in all the consumer goods we are using today. Levolinic acid, same, is a building block. Once you convert the biomass, so the agriculture waste, into this molecule, levolinic acid, you can then refine it, and you can go into a large number of applications. So today, for example, we are addressing markets such as personal care, such as pens and coatings, such as agrochemical, such as like the home care uh, market. Mm -hmm. And this, this molecule, it starts off as a white powder, is that right, when you've, when you've converted it? No, no, this is a liquid. 
Okay, and then how does it turn from a liquid to kind of getting into those products that you've mentioned? So we don't do any fermentation. We do like a thermal reaction, so you have a reactor and a chemical reaction. And to give you some, some example of how the products are being used, this will be potentially like helpful to you. So we target ingredients which are under regulation. So the EU are coming out with like a long list of ingredients, of chemicals which are harmful for people and also like to the planet. Those ingredients are being phased out. Okay, and what we do, we target those ingredients and replace them. So if I take a few examples, if you go to personal care, I mean shampoo. Shampoo are made today of silicon. Silicon is an ingredient which is not biodegradable, means like it doesn't degrade. And when you shower, I mean like this silicon is accumulating in the water. So we replace silicon. Preservatives, I mean preservatives are today like in the food we are eating. Preservatives, I mean like are being phased out because people don't want preservatives anymore in the food. We replace preservatives. If we take to talk about also like pesticides, I mean everybody is eating like fruit, vegetables, obviously like we like to have our fruit and vegetables, I mean like as, as safe as possible. So we also like work to develop bio-based pesticides, but I could also continue and mention also like sunscreen, develop sunscreen which are much more sustainable and, and much safer for people. So this is what we're trying to do to basically deliver hand products which are safer for people and the planet, but more importantly also trying to tackle this uh, problem relating to CO2 emission because considering that the chemical industry is one third of the oil demand, this is something potentially people don't realize. But I mean, even if you focus on areas that people are concerned about safety, I mean, the list, the potential uses for this molecule are so long. I mean, you mentioned some of them, pharmaceuticals, plastics, fragrances, and even pesticides, right? So how do you decide what to focus on? So first of all, what's important to say is we started 12 years ago. So at the time, I moved from Arsenal to AC Milan, and I co-founded the, the company. So it's a long process. We're not building an app. So it's uh, deep tech and we are building like inf large infrastructure uh, industries. So it took us 11 years to finally be on the market and be able to sell the, the product. So sometimes I get the question, okay, but what have you been doing for, for 11 years? So um, what's important to mention is you first have to develop the technology. Okay, today we have 200 patents in 40 different families. So you develop the technology in a lab. Once you have proved the technology in a the lab, then you have to move to a larger scale. To prove the, the technology at a larger scale, you have to go through like a pilot plant. This also takes time. Once you have achieved that, then you have to go through all the certification. So uh, what we call REACH, I mean like the equivalent of FDA, you know, like for, for, for food and, and, and pharmaceuticals. So you have to go through a long process. And once you have finally reached like th those registration and you can enter the market, then you start entering in, 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 uh, in relationship with like all the customers. Customers, we're talking about the large FMCG company, PNG, Unidiverse, and others, and also the large chemical groups, which obviously have on the agenda to accelerate this transition. The question is like, are we doing enough, and are we doing it quick enough? Because when we look at the, the challenge those days and climate change, I mean, we need to accelerate this transition. If it takes 10 years to bring a new molecule to the market, I mean, we're definitely not doing it quick enough. Mm. And, but do you have these focus areas? I mean, is household products one of the areas that you're focusing on? So yeah, we're definitely focusing on the low-hanging fruits. I mean, like products mm -hmm. which are under massive regulation, products which are being phased out. So definitely like personal care is one of the important markets for us. Mm -hmm. because like shampoo, like you Shampoo, mentioned. deodorant, because this is a direct interaction with the customers. And mm -hmm. there is a, a lot of innovation, and I would say personal care is driving innovation, and you start in personal care, and then you can move on to other, other, other applications. So definitely personal care is for us like a priority. Uh, we're talking about also home care, because mm -hmm. obviously like, uh, when you have keys or when you, you clean your house, I mean, you want to make sure you use like safer product. So all those things are extremely important when you consider that your bigger, biggest organ is your skin. If you use shampoo, uh, if you use like shower gel, which are full of harmful ingredients, I mean, every day and basically you intoxicate yourself. So this is, uh, those are the market which we're targeting, mm -hmm. which are basically like uh, under massive pressure from the regulator and under massive pressure also from the consumers. Okay. Um, I mean, you spoke a bit about how long it's taken to get to, to the market phase. I mean, are these barriers that you've encountered or the reasons why it took so long, are, is that a like, systematic problem? I mean, do you think these regulatory hoops that companies like yours are having to jump through, is that kind of squashing innovation in the sector? So I think the pressure coming from the consumers are having a massive drive on the regulator. 
But obviously, the regulator has to be even more aggressive, I would say, in this aspect. He has to protect the people, he has to protect the, the planet, and also they need to stand up for, for like this transition. So I think definitely like the regulator action is very important. Also, I mean, we're addressing, um, I would say, a very old industry. Okay, this is a, a massive industry, and we all know that in massive industry, changes takes more time. So what we are doing, we're not going against this industry, we're partnering with the big players, with the large chemical groups, and we help them accelerate this transition. I think also what's important to mention is, in this industry, it's difficult to also think that innovation come from outside. If you take a large player, such as like BASF, Dow Chemicals, or others, it's difficult for them to think, okay, I mean, innovation will come from outside the company, and we need to also like collaborate with, with smaller company. If you take the tech, if you look at the tech world, Amazon from this world, Facebook, Google, they all have incubators because they are very much aware that innovation can come from outside and it's important that we partner with them from the early stage. So this is something new happening, you know, in the chemical industry, realizing that you can have companies which have been focusing for 10, 11, 15 years on some molecules and innovation can come from outside. So this is another aspect. And the third one, I think, is, is a regulator in terms of like, uh, giving opportunity to those no molecules to enter the market quicker because certification takes a long time. Uh, there is a lot of discussion around like changing the regulation and making it like uh, um, uh, with quicker, you know, like uh, uh, enter to the market. This is very important. Mm. And it feels like obviously this is an industry where regulation plays a big role, and it does feel like policymakers are paying a lot more attention. I mean, you mentioned the Green Deal in 2020. The EU published a new chemical strategy as part of its zero pollution ambition. I mean, does it feel like there's this new momentum um, among lawmakers to kind of back you up and to say, yes, the chemicals industry does need to be more sustainable? Definitely. I think we see with the Green Deal, I mean, there is a, a strong desire to accelerate this transition. We were talking about pollution zero. Unfortunately, that has been postponed. Uh, it was announced like a few days ago. So we also see that there is some lobbies and there are some people with an interest of like postponing this transition. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fight. It's a fight which we have to win. I think more and more, I mean, like, we are realizing, I mean, which is a, a extremely important, but I think creating awareness. I mean, today I came without any presentation because I don't think the focus is, is on Jeff Biochemicals, a company which I founded, but it's more on, like, creating awareness and telling people that, I mean, every day they have this power of choosing the right product instead of the wrong product. You know, when you buy, when you make your shopping, when you go to supermarket, when you buy like a, a washing machine, you know, detergent, when you buy like a shampoo, when you buy some personal care product, you have an opportunity to basically like contribute to this effort and to choose a better product instead of product generating a lot of CO2 emission or like incorporating harmful ingredients. So for me, I mean, creating awareness, being able to talk about chemical industry, which is an industry which is very much unknown, is also very important. Mm, and you talk about this fight between people who don't want maybe the sustainability goals to be set so high. I mean, what is GF Biochemicals' role in this fight? Do you see it as just as raising awareness or is there other things that you can do as well? I mean, first of all, we have a total commitment. I mean, we started like 12 years ago and part of our DNA, of our DNA is to bring solution to a major problem. So what we're trying to do is like, more than a fight, we're trying to, to collaborate because I think this is very important to create bridges with all those large chemical companies, all those large FMCG companies. So our main goal is to accelerate this transition by partnering with those large group. I think also creating awareness like I'm doing today, being able to talk about it and to try to, to put in the, in the mind of people and then to realize that they can really have also an impact themselves and bring a solution because I think it's very important to identify a, prob a problem but more important is to bring a solution. So as I've seen before, I mean, like, we have more and more solution to address those problems, and that brings me a lot of hope. And just to finish, is like, I think we see the next generation putting also a lot of pressure, I would say, on those big groups. When you see Greta Thunberg in the street, when you see kids of, like, 11, 12, 13 years old in the street fighting for the future, I mean, this, like, brings a lot of hope. I don't think at my... At at this age, I was like in the street fighting for my future. So those people are going to be the next consumers. Those people are going to take the lead, you know, like very soon. So we have to be ready with that, and we have to be ready with solutions. So you co-founded GF Biochemicals back in 2008, but you only became CEO this year. What made you take that decision? Why did you feel like y you wanted to lead the company? 
So first, for many years, I was also like a football player. So as you were saying, I played for Arsenal, I played for AC Milan, so it's difficult <laughs> to be a top elite athlete, I would say, where you have to commit 200% and running a company. So I had to wait a little bit before I, I took like an active role um, first. Secondly, we also like brought some investors. I mean, after 10 years of work, it was very important to validate everything which we have done. It was very important to bring also some institutional investor to kind of like bring even more credibility. Because sometimes, you know, when you're a football player and you end up like being, uh, creating like a biochemical company, I mean, like there is a lot of questions, a lot of doubt. <laughs> So, so we needed, you know, like to bring like strategical investors to validate all the work which we have done, and to finish is has uh, been like uh, it's been a real passion for the past ten years because, I mean, uh, as I was saying before, we didn't create an app. It was uh, every day a fight. Every day I had like a, a tens of reason to stop, and uh, you had to basically like really be passionate about what you do. If not, I mean, like obviously you stop. So for me, it was the right time bringing some investors, taking the company to a next level. And at the same time, you know, I've stopped playing football like two years ago, so I have plenty of time now to focus on, on the company I co-founded. And then just finally, before we move on to all the great questions that are coming in, how do the stress levels compare between being a CEO and being a professional footballer? <laughs> this is a good question. Uh, I think you have a lot of parallels between being like a football player and an entrepreneur. Obviously, like, it's slightly different. You know, when you play in front of 60, 70,000 people, the stress is slightly different than, you know, you in your room with, 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 with your colleagues. But I think you have a lot of parallel. I mean, like, definitely, like, perform under pressure. You know, when you, as I was saying, play in front of a lot of people, you have a huge pressure. But also when you're an entrepreneur, when you invest your personal money, when you have to find solution every day to problems, I mean, your head, your shoulder are against the wall. So you have no other... I mean, no other um, solution than to, to bring like uh, to, to bring the, the company forward. Then you have also like dedication, hard work. This is something you find in the life of an, of, a, of an athlete, but also as an entrepreneur. I mean, like his full dedication, his hard work, his resilience, and uh, um, it's it's something which I find in both world. And, and maybe to finish also like the leadership leadership role, team spirit. You have to be able to inspire, but at the same time you have to be able to listen to others create this team spirit because in the life of an athlete you have up and down, but in the life of an entrepreneur you also have a lot of up and down and you have to be able to, to face those problems. So I think the team spirit is very important. So for me, a lot of learnings which I've experienced as a football player have been able to help me in the life of an entrepreneur. <laughs>